I'm Tim Edwards, Senior Vice President of Analog and Platform at eFabulous, the online platform for chip design and fabrication and more using open source tools and host for a growing community of designers and service providing partners. At eFabless, we've always championed the use of open source tools for chip design. And since I'm also the developer of open source electronic design automation tools myself on the web circuit opencircuitdesign.com, I have happily been maintaining and developing my own set of tools on the system while championing the use of open source tools generally and encouraging developers everywhere to keep providing more and better tools for the job. The problem with the use of open source tools for making chips is well known. These tools are not like the open source tools used for making documents or so many of the things open source software is used for these days in one key aspect. They rely entirely on closed source data to run. Every tool must access a process design kit, AKA PDK, which describes a specific foundry process in terms of device characteristics, rules of design related to that process, and usually some ready-made libraries of components that help make the process attractive to designers. It's not an obvious leap of thought to suppose that the proprietary data from the foundry means proprietary software has to be used to do something with it, but open source software is notably not good at protecting data this way. This gets into the usual argument of information wants to be free, at eFabless, we've tried to find some useful balance between the open source tools and the proprietary data. Describing that is an entire talk in itself, and I've given that talk before, but what we found and what you might expect is that no matter how you do it, compromises have to be made. As you can see from the diagram, it's complicated, and it means that the burden of supporting all of this infrastructure is on eFabless. In the end, it comes down to the fact that if we want to support design targeting a particular foundry, that foundry has to be okay with our methods and sign off on them. Some foundries are and some foundries aren't. For most of the history of chip design, silicon foundry PDKs have been a place of secret knowledge, non-disclosure agreements, licensed servers, and password protected download sites. The proprietary and closed nature of foundry processes has been aided and embedded by the commercial EDA tool vendors. There are only a handful of such vendors and they can maintain their dominance because support for their tools and formats is a real burden on the foundry. So it is in the foundry's best interest to limit the number of tools it supports. Consequently, EDA, tools, uh, EDA software now holds an unusual niche, thriving in the shrinking space of licensed commercial tools generally. The expense of these tools in particular, but also their inability to update quickly or correct problems rapidly, makes chip design a very difficult space for engineers to explore, grow, or diversify in. Engineers, if they can afford the tools at all, find themselves constrained by the tools they use and the methods that those tools provide. This argument only holds up if you believe that the commercial tool vendors are not providing the best possible software and services, and I'm sure the commercial tool EDA vendor representatives will disagree with me vehemently. But we've been here before with operating systems and compilers and web servers and document editors, and I think this argument is well established, and I don't need to get Richard Stallman or Eric Raymond here to make the argument for me. I talk to design engineers all over the world every day, and I know what their frustrations are. And as a designer, I've been there myself many times. In the early days of EDA, through the late 80s and early 90s, many design tools were in fact open source, and many like Spice, Magic, This, Sys, etc., were distributed freely even before this became a common practice in software. And of course, they were mostly shared among universities in the US, there being no World Wide Web at the start of that period, and no Google, no SourceForge, no GitHub. The Moses Foundation, the shuttle run service provider, provided uh, supported multiple fabs and processes with a partly open source PDK, which it called SCMOS for scalable CMOS. The SCMOS PDKs worked because they used conservative rules that didn't reveal manufacturing limits. Device models and parameters, though, were not freely available and could only be obtained after signing an NDA through Moses. Some of what we've done at eFabless to work around the problem of proprietary foundry data is along the same lines as the Moses model. In other words, giving the user conservative rules or obfuscated cell views. 
But the only real workable solution to this is to free the Foundry data and make it all available to the end user. For that, we need an open source PDK. And so we arrive at the Google Skywater project. The Google Skywater open source PDK was launched this past July with a repository on GitHub under Google slash Skywater dash PDK. The launch happened with relatively little fanfare due to the pandemic and the corresponding lack of in-person conferences, workshops, and so forth that had pre been previously planned. Nevertheless, the opening talk by Tim Ansell from Google for the Fosse Foundation dial-up series, also with the URL shown here, had several hundred participants and the accompanying Slack and IRC channels devoted to the topic quickly ramped up to thousands of members. There was, before that, nearly a year of negotiating. The Skywater Foundry in Minnesota, a spinoff from Cypress Semiconductor, was behind the idea from the beginning. While fabs on the cutting edge of technology can be expected to remain resistant to revealing anything about their processes, foundries like Skywater with well-established nodes in the range of, say, 0.5 micron down to 0.13 micron, have generally been more open and user-friendly, although before now, not to the point of making a public release of their technical data. But there is a clear business model that recognizes the advantages of making these older and well-established processes public knowledge. Certainly, every PDK represents a large amount of work done by the foundry in refining design rules and characterizing and modeling de devices. At some point, though, the problem becomes one of maintaining non-disclosure agreements, uh, tracking customers, providing a large amount of customer support, and maintaining the PDK. Download sites need to be provided and maintained. Errors and other issues have to be tracked and fixed, and documentation has to be written and updated. And the Foundry is usually considered responsible for providing useful IP to the end user, including digital standard cell libraries, pad frame IO libraries, RAM and ROM compilers, and critical analog circuits like crystal oscillators, voltage regulators, band gap references, and power on reset generators. Much of this work has very little to do with the day-to-day -day foundry operations of manufacturing and represent a huge overhead to them. The idea behind the open source PDK is that you can offload a large number of tasks related to PDK and EDA tool support to the public. By making the repository publicly accessible, you end up with a community of end users that can provide mutual support for understanding how to use the process with different tools. It's then no longer the responsibility of the foundry to provide this user support, maintain the support for tools, or even potentially to manage user submissions for shuttle runs. Problems found by the community will be fixed by the community. Missing functionality will be provided by the community as well. In the spirit of open source, the vast majority of the support and IP can be expected to be provided under open source licensing. This isn't just wishful thinking. We have the community and we're already seeing the contributions. For the designer, the gains are very clear. There's no longer a need to sign NDAs and no concern over what information may or may not be shared with others, especially tool developers who need to see a failing example in order to properly debug a problem with the software. Entire designs can be published, including schematics and layouts without restrictions, and designs can be put into public repos like GitHub and GitLab, ready to be downloaded and sent to manufacture or used within another design or modified, improved, and republished as a remix. So the design of hardware now looks much like the design of software or the design of 3D printed things. It's public, dynamic, and ever improving. The biggest promise is what my CTO, Mohammed Qasim, likes to refer to as the democratization of hardware. The shifting of custom hardware design from a handful of large and established companies and well-funded research institutions to individuals, small companies, startups, lesser known universities, community colleges, and even high schools. In-house design will give way to project collaborations that span the globe. So back to open source tools. It's not strictly necessary for an open source PDK to be used with open source tools, but Google's goal is to make sure that open source tools are given top priority for support by supplying the PDK data and IP libraries in common formats, well-documented and easy for an open source tool developer to code or obtain a parser for. 
The Google Skywater PDK goes further than the SCMOS PDKs that, uh, from Moses ever did. Not only are the exact design rules of the Foundry available, but even specialty rules such as SRAM and flash memory are made public as well. All device models and parameters characterized at corners are part of the repository. In a sense, the huge amount of data available in the open source PDK provides a new challenge the older tools that once worked with the SCMOS PDKs never had the depth and breadth of access to IP and formats. The new PDK provides everything needed for full tool chains, analog, digital, or mixed signal. The older tools don't have the complete integration that the commercial EDA tools enjoy, having traditionally had only a fraction of the files and formats available. Open source EDA tool developers should take advantage of the organization of files and formats to create the tool integration into complete flows that's so badly needed. One obvious benefit to having an open PDK for open source EDA tools is simply the fact that when a bug is found in a tool, the person who finds the bug can post the example reproducing the problem in, say, the public GitHub issue tracker for the tool. No need to obfuscate the example or create a similar example with an academic process. What you get then is rapid response and an immediate upgrade when the fix is done. Case in point, when the open lane digital tool flow was released, users discovered a problem with my NetGen LVS tool where the symmetry breaking routine at the end was causing LVS to take hours to finish. Right after this issue was raised in the Slack channel, I was able to pin down the problem, and by the next day, I had reduced the runtime for NetGen down to a few minutes. Here are some projects using Google Skywater. Some of them are also being presented at Wasit. I don't have time to discuss all of them or in detail, but since the main ones have been featured in the FOSSI dial-up talks, I'll point you there. The, uh, these are projects that were around before Google Skywater, but adapted to it easily. OpenRAM lets the chip designer generate SRAM blocks, keeping this critical IP from being some mysterious thing to be trusted but not inspected. The OSU standard cell library is not only a valuable IP library, but it's presented along with the complete set of tools and methods they used for the standard cell design and characterization. The open lane flow is a digital synthesis flow based around the open road tools with specific attention to working with the mature process nodes and specifically the Skywater 130 nanometer process. Open lane has filled in one of the known big gaps in open source tools by integrating scan chain insertion into the synthesis flow. Open lane also provides chip top level assembly and routing. As a demonstration that open source EDA tools like the ones I just mentioned are already capable of handling the end-to-end -end design of a complete and non-trivial custom chip, eFabless designed and produced a series of RISC-V microcontrollers collectively named Strive and made entirely with open source EDA tools and com containing exclusively open source IP. These designs will be placed in the eFabless GitHub repository and available for anyone to download, inspect, and reuse. One of the biggest challenges needed to make the open source PDK ecosystem work well, as I mentioned earlier, is an integrated system of tools for multiple workflows. The open lane digital synthesis flow that I just mentioned works well for digital synthesis and for chip assembly. But a complete ecosystem needs analog and mixed signal flows as well and some kind of common overall infrastructure for files, including both files needed for tool setups and files that describe the IP libraries. My own contribution to this is the OpenPDKs tool, which is a GNU automake autoconf based system that uses various shell and Python scripts to prepare the right files and environments for different open source tools. That currently includes ng-spice, magic, klayout, netgen, and openlane. You can think of it as a supplement to the Google Skywater repo. While digital synthesis flows are powerful and modeled on software flows, going from hardware description languages to layout, there will, in my opinion, always be a need for traditional analog design. The need for open source analog design flows reveals a glaring gap in the ecosystem. There's no common agreed upon format for schematic editing and capture. I've been working with interns over the summer to help determine what such a format should look like and generate useful tools in support of analog design flows.
We settled on using the XSCIM format as a standard schematic and capture, uh, schematic and symbol format with the idea of supporting additional formats over time by writing translation scripts for them. There's one project that I'd like to call out that defines a common set of generic digital symbols. Then, by parsing a, lib a liberty file for digital cell names and functions, a digital library from a PDK can be automatically converted into a simple library for any of a number of schematic entry tools like XSCIM, XCircuit, XIC, or KiCad. Additional information, such as from SPICE files, can also be parsed and substituted into the generic symbol library for netlisting and simulation. Another intern started a project to automatically generate schematics from SPICE netlists, which is a fairly wide open area for development, both for digital schematics and analog schematics, each of which has its own specific set of issues for analog schematic generation. One thing that the summer internships underscored for me is that a huge amount of work remains to be done to define the proper analog and mixed signal open source design flows. Some of my interns have five minute presentations in the WASIT workshop and I encourage you to check them out. The Google Skywater open source PDK isn't some academic exercise. Google is underwriting multi-project wafer shuttle runs on the Skywater process starting this month with the express purpose of encouraging designers to use the process and the open PDK to explore the boundaries of the design space. The more experimental, the better. Management of the design submissions for these shuttle runs will be handled by eFabless. We've designed a one-size-fits-all chip harness, as Tim Ansel likes to call it, or you might call it a container for user projects. I named this chip Caravel after the type of sailing ship, and I hope the name conveys the idea of something carrying valuable cargo and also evokes the idea of exploration. Also, it has an R and V in the name, which I like to use for chips that I design that have a RISC-V processor in them. The general idea is that you make a design which is open source and available somewhere in a public repository. You put your design in the harness and we get it manufactured at Skywater and we send it back to you assembled on a demonstration board along with additional packaged parts complete with, of course, open source test software. The shuttle run management itself provides new challenges for open source EDA tools and the sheer amount of data involved in reticle preparation is most likely going to stress the limits of a number of tools. But the results will build community and will be fed back directly into making each subsequent shuttle run just a little bit better. So, in conclusion, the Google Skywater 130 nanometer open PDK is right now available to the public on GitHub being the first ever fully open source silicon foundry process description. The PDK includes fully open source IP libraries and formats suitable for open source EDA tool design flows. A thriving ecosystem of tools and tool development is already forming around this online offering. It has no NDAs. It works without expensive closed source software. You get lots of good IP libraries for free. The community that we are growing here must ensure that these tools and files stay fluid and adaptable. We want open source hardware to really mirror what's happened with open source software. I encourage all designers, developers, anybody with good ideas to come and be a part of this community and explore what's possible. Keep it open source, and thank you.